Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. My name is Peter Cotgreave and I'm one of the directors of the Royal Society and it is my enormous pleasure to welcome you all here this evening for this joint event with the Royal Shakespeare Company. And before I introduce this evening's speakers, I have a couple of housekeeping announcements. Firstly, could you please turn off your mobile phones and that's not just as a courtesy to the other people in the room and to the speakers who are all busy turning off their mobile phones, um, but the event is being webcast live and is also being recorded and uh, will become part of the uh, video archive of the Royal Society at royalsociety.tv. So if you miss anything, you can watch it again, and if you really enjoy yourself and think that someone should have been here who wasn't, you can tell them and they can watch it again. Now... As I said, this is a joint event organised with the Royal Shakespeare Company, and this year is the 50th anniversary of the cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin's pioneering first ever human flight in space. And coinciding with this anniversary, the Royal Shakespeare Company's new play, Little Eagles, is opening at the Hampstead Theatre next month. So it's my very great pleasure to introduce the three speakers. On my immediate right is Rona Munro, who has written extensively for stage, film, radio and television, including Iron at the Traverse Theatre in Edinburgh. She's written for Doctor Who, and she wrote the film Lady Bird, Lady Bird, which was directed by Ken Loach. She wrote the new play Little Eagles, which charts the space race from the perspective of the Soviet Union, bringing to life the fascinating but rather little-known story of the space engineer Sergei Korolev. On my far right is Professor John Zarnecki, who is a professor of space science at the Open University and was formerly the director of the Centre for Earth, Planetary, Space and Astronomical Research. He's got over 30 years' experience of space research, spanning a number of space missions, including sounding rockets, Earth-orbiting missions, and interplanetary flights. And in the middle, who will chair this evening's discussion, Dr. Piers Sellers. Piers was selected as a can an astronaut candidate by NASA in 1996, and he is now a veteran of three space flights and he has logged it says here although he refused to confirm the precise figures earlier on 34 days 23 hours 3 minutes and 56 seconds in space including 41 it says here EVA hours and I didn't know what that meant so I went and looked it up and it means extra vehicular activity and it means he parked his spaceship and got out for a total of 41 hours over six spacewalks. And before joining the astronaut corps at NASA, Piers worked on research into how the Earth's biosphere and atmosphere interact. And he received an OBE earlier this year for his services to science and now I am delighted to pass over to Dr. Sellers, who will chair this evening's discussion. Piers. Thank you. Um, good evening, everybody. It's great to see you all. Thanks for turning out. Uh, John and I got here early for the free tea and biscuits to lounge around in the Royal Society, and that allowed us an opportunity to gang up on the odd one out <laughs> in our group, which is Rona, because she's younger. Uh, John and I, uh, old geezers that we are, we were around to see the space race happen, whereas Rona has basically researched it post facto. So I was wondering why a playwright would be drawn to the kind of uh, not well-known story, but um, the very interesting story of Sergei Pavlovich Korolev. Well, I'll have to start by coming clean, and, and of course I do remember the space race, or I do remember the, the section of it that was Apollo and the moon landings, and that was such a part of my childhood. And I, I, mean, I think I had two sort of twin obsessions at the time, 
One was um, the, the kind of James Burke and you mm -hmm. know the programmes we were talking about, where you actually got to watch those yeah. moon landings and moon missions live, and the excitement of that. And my brother building a, a, a space rocket in the garage. That at that age, I really believed he was going to get up there. I really mm -hmm. believed we were all going to get up there. Mm -hmm. um, and then there, there was that point in later life when the um, RSC approached me and said, we're looking for play, big history plays, mm -hmm. plays about big history. And at the same time, I'd just become aware of a lot of books and articles that were current at the time that were all dwelling on the fact that, in fact, I think it's like 12 men have actually walked on the moon and a few of them are already dead and the mm -hmm. rest are certainly quite elderly. And I suddenly realised that this this kind of story that I thought was going yeah, to be don't our Don't tell Buzz future. Aldrin that, by the way. The <laughs> elderly. <laughs> oh, right. He'll slap you. you right. 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 Sure. Yeah. Um, but it's just that this thing that I thought was going to be the future had turned into history just like that. And I thought, well, that is that is the history that I'm interested in. And I, I started off doing all this research about Apollo and reading those stories, which are all incredible, and we could probably mm -hmm. talk for a very long time about that. But in the middle of it all, I just thought, well, I'd better just check what the Soviets were up to. And that's when I uncovered all these stories, which I think at the time we weren't aware of because the Iron Curtain was up. And then, mm -hmm. of course, since it came down, nobody was that interested in the early years of, of space. So it, I'm, I'm sure you guys were all always very well informed about people like Sergei Korolev. But for the rest of us, you know, in, in they're just... We didn't know them. They were completely unfamiliar stories. And that was the attraction, I think, and also their extremity, because it was it just this sense of what they were doing was impossible, and they were doing it with nothing, and they were doing it first, and they were doing it under the particular regime there was in the Soviet Union at the time, and they were doing it coming out of a background of war and deprivation and with mm -hmm. limited resources and everything well, about it. Harsh project management environment. We Indeed. Call that these days. Yeah. 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 Stalin. So, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> definition of Stalin. So it was, I think that's, that was the thing. It was the initial interest in space that had been very much part of my childhood. Mm -hmm. And then just uncovering this incredible story that, that I hadn't known about, which was more extreme than anything else I'd ever heard about. What's the thing that, that, that you know, when you read his life story, the mm -hmm. struggle, which eventually cost him his health and his life, Yes. Um, what's the thing that you really strikes you about the man? I mean, the engineer, the genius as an engineer, and the way he pulled this, this amazing trick out of nothing mm. is incredible. The first satellite, the first man in space, from a country with a very rickety industrial base and all its political problems. So what does that tell you about the man? I think it... Besides looking like Kevin Spacey, which he does a little Do bit. Think? Yeah, he does. Yeah, he, oh, he no, does, yeah. they're too broad. No, when he was young, yeah. <laughs> Uh, um, off, not Kevin Spacey. Yes, yeah. obviously. Yeah. Um, what? And now you see I've completely forgotten the question. Oh, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> I got distracted by Kevin Spacey. Uh, how did he come across as a person to you? It's the drive. Yeah. And, and it, there's, a, there's a story we've put in the play which I probably paraphrased by fictionalising it, so I, I may be misremembering it, but basically. He was, as a young um, scientist, put in the gulag by um, Stalin, right. as a lot of the rocket scientists were. Uh, and it seems to me the logic Stalin was operating under was that R Russia was doing really well at, in rocket science, and so was Germany, so they must be talking to each other, so they must be traitors, so send them all to the gulag. I mean, right. it seemed to be some kind of twisted logic like that. So he was in this gulag in Siberia, and then, of course, they got to the point where World War II is looming, and they need rocket scientists, so he gets the message, if you report to Moscow, we will review your case. But he has to get himself from Siberia to Moscow, and he has to walk from the gulag to the port where the ship is, and then the, the ship has already sailed, and he has to spend a whole winter, right. Siberian winter, hiding out till he can get to Moscow. And if you read, I mean, there was other, and other steps along that journey where he nearly died, but he kept going. And you think, well, what would make a guy who was basically still a prisoner, who's being asked to report to his own review board, and at the point he did and um, got um, uh, recruited onto a, um, a kind of rocket building team, he was still a prisoner initially. What would make someone do that? And what would make someone survive a journey like that? And you've got to think, well, that's somebody whose dream or whose will to live and realise his ambitions is so strong 
it's it is on of heroic proportions and i think it all that's just like the start and then every stage of that story of what he did and how he achieved it you see that same drive and that same determination to get to get up there really it's interesting because I've, I've worked in russia quite a lot over the last uh 13 years and spent some time actually in the rocket factory the energia rocket factory where korolev he was the head of that and so i met people who knew him when they were younger. And his presence is still there, the, the force of his personality, the example, and all that. And um, even now, whenever uh, they launch uh, Soyuz, the four boosters peel off and make a cross in the, in the sky, and they call that the Korolev Cross wow. to this day, because it's like a little constellation that uh, he, he made it, he made it. and uh, they still salute it. Now, John, John is the only person I know who's been within 10 feet of Gagarin that's in London. It, it's true, yeah, yeah. guilty. Um, I apologise to those who, who, who know this story, but, but you haven't, so I, 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 I repeat it. I, I, um, I was at school uh, in North London um, when the flight took place, 1961, and um, the school was about uh, 500 yards from Highgate Cemetery, where, of course, Karl Marx is buried. And in those days, every visiting Russian dignitary had to pay homage um, at uh, Karl Marx's uh, resting place. So school was cancelled for the day. I mean, this was the most famous man on earth. And I can, you know, I've got vague memories of my motivation, but it was a toss-up between, I think, going to the park to play cricket or play with the Game Boy or whatever you did in 1961. Um, or... <laughs> Um, your wooden, uh, anyway, your wooden Game Boy. Well, I'm wooden <laughs> Game Boy, yeah. Um, but anyway, I, I just remember a, a small group of us did end up in Highgate Cemetery, and it was all fairly low key. I mean, there were two or three policemen, I think, and and then this this gaggle of of important people came along, and I was near the front, and 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 you know the enormity of what this man had achieved. Um, suddenly, you know, descended upon me. Mm -hmm. And I know several people, you know, people say this, but one was struck by how small he was. I mean, I suppose yeah. you expected him to be a giant because of what he'd achieved. I mean, what was it, 108 minutes in space. Yeah. Um, but he really was tiny. I remember he was Jesus. dwarfed yeah. by the... By the enormous Russian military hat, and, and there I was a few feet from him, and he was saluting in front of uh, Karl Marx. And, um, and I don't know if I believe in Eureka moments, but I think that was it for me. And, and you know, I, I decided I wanted to have some of that action because for me, space had been, you know, really it, it had been Dan Dare in, in the, the boys' comic, The Eagle. And then suddenly there was this man who, who, who made it possible. And, and almost anything was possible, I think, from then. So I don't think it's just the passage of time, but for me that was, that was an important chance, pure chance event. And if it hadn't been for that, you probably would have been a rock star or something. Uh, ooh, or was <laughs> something yeah. respectable yeah. like a playwright or yeah. a, you know, a, a city banker even. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I dimly remember the Gagarin flight, very dimly. But I think the first sort of uh, real space moment that I remember was my uh, uncle showing me a big colour photograph of taken of the Earth, the Earth's limb, out of a Gemini capsule. So you could see the window and you could see the schnoz of the, of the Gemini in view. So it was a combination of a machine that someone's sitting in, taking a photo out, and there's the world. And I thought, wow. That's impressive. I really would like to be involved in something like that. And it, it fired me up. And a whole lot of you know, people of our generation it got yeah. them interested in science, and whoosh, off it, we went. It was all through the 60s, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, it was I, very I, exciting. I remember many nights sat up in yeah. front of, of the television set. I mean, I remember to this day what the television set looks like. And, you know, the combination of the, the flaky technology on the spacecraft and the probably flaky television transmissions meant that what you saw was sometimes quite challenging to decipher. But, you know, the, I remember the drama of it all as well. Yeah. Apart from the, the science and the technology, which was so exciting, 
I have to say the drama of it all did yeah. appeal to and, me. And it was well written, whoever was writing it, because it was a cliffhanger. You didn't know how it was going to end up. Right about 1964 or 65, you didn't know how this was going to work, work out, because Korolev was still pulling rabbits out of his hat, you know, with uh, firsts, 63, 64, 65 even, mm -hmm. uh, spacewalk and stuff like that. Poor guy was pedaling as hard as he could to, to get as much out of the technology he had. Yes. But uh, you have a feel for that, of, of how he knew he was slipping behind the Americans, but still was trying hard to beat them psychologically. And I think, himself, I think once the race had started, there yeah. was no pulling out. And I think we were talking about it earlier, about whether he'd quite consciously started the race in order mm -hmm. to realise his ambition. But of course, having started it, they're asking him to keep winning with less and less and less resources. And I think latterly he was really concerned about the design of Soyuz not being ready, wasn't he? And yeah. yet th there was still this pressure, you've got to push it up there, you've got to push it up there. And of course there was a, a tragedy um, shortly after he died when they did push up Soyuz and, right. uh, and Komarov, Cosmonaut Komarov died. Yep, they lost, um, the, lost the crew and the vehicle. Yeah. Uh, parachute failure, that's yeah. right. And they put them back for quite a while. That was their Apollo 1. Yes. Sort of. They had to go back mm. to the drawing board and, and figure it all out again. Mm. So. And I think it's hard for us to remember or recreate the, the, the Cold War atmosphere, which was so prevalent and so, I think, dominant in mm -hmm. this, this whole, whole game, really. Um, it it's yeah. played such an important part. You know, uh, for, for well, some of us, it was... I about that. I mean, uh, you've, you've got this uh, interesting heritage, for example. Your dad's from Poland. Mum's from England, right? Yeah, so it right. added a little something to it. I mean, it had this tremendous regard for the, the Russians, the Soviets, and what they'd achieved from a scientific and a technological point of view. But, you know, having some Polish blood in me gives one a, a slightly ambivalent, <laughs> shall I say, uh, attitude towards the Russians. And, you know, so that, you know, that yeah. added a certain je ne sais quoi, I yeah. suppose, to the, to the whole, whole business. Um, it was... It was a fascinating time. There was a lot know? going on. There, there was a lot going on, and growing up in London in the 60s also added a certain right. something, I have yeah. to say. Yeah. It's quite interesting, because I don't know what, what your guys' perception was, though, because as a child, I was very much aware of the romance of space and the sense that human beings were going up there, and I didn't really have the awareness I do now, looking back, that it was so much part of the Cold War, and it was about America yes. beating Russia. No question. And, and, and it's quite interesting, because at the time, of course, that, that wasn't what was inspiring about it. That wasn't the dream. That wasn't presumably what got you going. It, it wasn't about beating Russia. It was about just getting out there. And there's that sense, isn't it, that, that, that there was probably a lot of people on both sides who were involved at that level, that they wanted to realise the dream. But the way you had to realise the dream was by doing it for your government, you know, planting the flag, doing it first. And I don't know if you think it's still like that. I, I think sort of moved more into um, a phase of collaboration. But, you know, the, the whole business of the Cold War, the space race, had unintended consequences too. Um, you know, one always thinks of the Apollo 8 photo mm. coming around the backside of the moon and there's the Earth rising up over the lunar surface and that photo I think had an enormous impact on people's consciousness you know looking at the earth from outside and everybody's down there except us three guys up here um, mm -hmm. that had an impact that went you know f some people say it kicked off the environmental movement I don't know certainly helped but there was a lot going on has anybody here, anybody here been within nine feet of Yuri Gagarin <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> You're good to go. So, I think it's worth talking about um, space as an inspiration. Certainly, you know, two believers over here, and I think a believer over there. Um, but we were talking before we walked in about the ambivalence that uh, society has towards space exploration. There's um, been the business, of course, it was a handmaiden of war originally, and that's where it started out, but it's also been a unifier in later years. Um, it's extremely expensive, and there are needs on Earth. How do you, how do you um, balance all that out? It's a difficult one, isn't it? It's a really yeah. difficult one. There you go. Um, People keep asking me, say, why do you spend all that money in space? Mm. Yeah. So I thought I'd ask you. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think for me, this, it's funny, because, of course, the whole play was, was trying to wrestle with that question, in a, in a sense. 
And it is really difficult because yeah. how can you, if you think all that money that both sides threw at it, all that energy, all those resources, had they, you know, put the same energy, money, and resources behind something like solving world hunger or curing cancer, or, you know, it, it, it surely would have been achievable because what they did achieve was impossible. So why why didn't they have a more worthy impossible dream? Mm-hmm. You could argue, but there's some, I think you. Something you said there when you're talking about the effect of that first image of seeing the Earth from space and, you know, three guys are up there and the whole of humanity is down there. There's something about this particular dream that makes us consider all sorts of things which it it overlaps with religion, it overlaps with morality and philosophy. It makes us consider what it means to be human. And I think anything that makes us do that is invaluable. And you can't... It's not the same if you send up a probe. Though I think there's a huge argument you could make that they should probably send a lot more probes and they would have got a lot more scientific information. And the geologists, like my dad, for instance, would have been a lot more happy if they'd got a lot more moon rocks back and Alan Shepard hadn't been up there playing golf when he was supposed to be doing scientific experiments. (laughs) You know, but, 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 there's something about a human being going out there and looking back with human eyes at the rest of us, that changes the way we all feel about being human. And I don't think you can put a price on that, actually. Yeah. I, was, I was talking to a priest once about this, and he said um, looking at space photos made him think of a few questions that went along the lines of, I didn't know the universe was that big. I wonder how far it goes on. Uh, is there anybody else out there? And last, where do I fit in? And uh, so, in some sense, technology gave theology a little ping mm. in, in, in his own particular universe. John? Uh, and, of course, you know, fundamental questions like that, namely our place in the universe and are we alone and so on, they are questions that we now are addressing through the space programme. It might not have been the original motivation for the pioneers way back, but, you know, by, by launching space telescopes to search for exoplanets, yeah. uh, for example, um, those are the sort of, you know, absolutely fundamental questions that, that the space program is, is, is addressing. It's, mm-hmm. it's not just about um, putting people up there and going places. Very important, though, that is. Do you think it's that's also- inspiring, you know, the sort of the whole business of the deep space research? Do you think that's got uh, an audience, a large audience on Earth? Well, it's not fair to ask me that question. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going Besides to... your family. You know, so. <laughs> um, yeah, a- absolutely. And, and to go back to one of your uh, original points, um, you, you said that it's expensive, that we yeah. spend a lot of money. Actually, I would argue that, at least in this country and in most of Europe, we don't really spend very much. Mm-hmm. We spend, I mean, to put it into to, to numbers, I think in this country we spend per person, if you spread it out across everybody, two or three pounds per year. Mm-hmm. Right. It's, it's pretty and mean. It's all spent here. It's all spent here. It's not spent in uh, right. Mars or on the surface of Titan or Venus. We spend it here on Earth. Right. And, and I must say that I used to think that it was fairly expensive, but in recent times, you know, when we've been... Well, there was a wonderful fact. The money that was spent, I think, on the bank bailouts in this country would have funded the UK space programme for 55 years. Wow. Or was it 500? I mean, it was, it was just, you know, it put the whole thing into context. Right. So, actually, I don't feel... I don't have a guilty conscience about spending this well, I'm, money. I'm hideously, bi- so I'm hideously biased, so I'm the right, you're, you're wrong person biased, to ask. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 So. so, the... Um, business of space still having the ability to inspire people, you think it's still there. We were there when there was a flat-out race going on. There was a lot at stake. You know that that was really the business of the day. Um, it's a bit different now. It, it, it is, and there there is more cynicism, and there's more about value for money and right. all and of we're these not boring trying to beat sort the other guy necessarily. So, uh, do you still think it has the ability to turn people on, get people uh, excited? Yeah, absolutely, no no doubt. I mean, I. It's not just us. It's, it's not just us. Or maybe it's just strange people <laughs> like us, but they're, they're, there are enough strange people out okay. there. I mean, part of my job is about encouraging people, mostly youngsters, but not, not entirely, um, to, to, to come to science or science, technology, mm-hmm. engineering subjects. And so 
you know, like many of us, like you do a great mm -hmm. deal, we go to schools, we go to all sorts of places to speak. And, and it is gratifying when a few years later you meet a student who said, you know, do you remember me? You yeah. came to the yeah. Barnsley Astronomical Society and you spoke seven years ago and, you know, I was so excited by whatever the subject was that I decided that I would, you know, go to university to study physics or maths or whatever. Yeah. So well, I, suppose yeah. I had a student who said, I, I heard you talk, and it was a great talk, but I went into finance. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, there is uh, that as well. I, yeah, well, yeah. What can you do? But, and, and, you know, there, there's, um, I think there's no doubt there is, there is much more science output on, in, in, in the media, and, and generally it's pretty good. And, and there's also no doubt that the, the standing of science in, in the political debate yeah. is... is, is so much higher than it ever was 20 years ago. Um, I, I think so. That's oh, great. Absolutely. I'm very glad I, I to hear no you, doubt. I'm um, very glad to hear you say that. Yeah, in, in this country. It, I mean, yeah. it was extremely low. It goes and, up and down. And it's, yeah. it's much higher. It really is, is on the political uh, radar now, whichever party it is. I think, you know, we saw that with the, the last government yeah. and, and with this government. That's incredible. So there has been a change. And, you know... I'm not just saying that because we're here, but the Royal Society is one of many organisations that pushes that agenda. But there's no doubt that the high-profile stuff like space, like astronomy, the search for life mm -hmm. plays a big part in that. Before we move on from the business of the past, you know, the, the history of space exploration and into talking about the future, I thought, John, you could show us something from your archives. Oh. Have you got... Well, it's, 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 it's the this... iconic picture, you know, yeah. that that everybody has seen, that, that, that wonderful uh, picture, which, which, you know, it's, it's got to have been retouched, hasn't it? I mean, he looks just too cherubic and, and angelic. I think he was. Was he? By, by all accounts, he, yeah. he looked it's, about 14 years old. Yeah. And, uh, and he was skin. very calm. And um, the thing you notice about it is very symmetric sort of look to the guy's face, you know. Yeah. And he, I mean, you, you presumably, as part of your research, you, you, you must have come across quite a lot about the choice, the final choice of, of, yes. of astronauts. Yes. And he wasn't necessarily the best qualified, though he was very good, wasn't he? But he fitted, he fitted many the agendas. Profile. And then there was, a, there was a huge rivalry, which I think is, is pretty common knowledge, between him and German Titov, who was right. arguably the more able candidate in as much as he was mm -hmm. scoring higher on all the tests and performing slightly better. I mean, there was a group of them, weren't there, that were all up there, but, the, but it was sort of came down to those two. Right. And at the end of the day, Gagarin was the tractor driver's son and right. German was the son of a teacher. So right. that tipped the balance. But, you know, when you look at the pictures of the two of them and you read interviews with the two I and you see all that footage of Gagarin going around the world... You have to wonder if someone was being even cleverer than that because he was just such an eminently likeable man. Mm -hmm. And I think it probably wore him out because he had no... He doesn't appear to dissemble. He, you know, he, he, just, he looks like one of those guys that just genuinely goes around the world and wants to shake everyone's hand. And then he becomes the most famous man in the world and he has to almost literally do that. And I can't imagine what the effect of that is on a person. Yeah, he's um, a young man. Yeah. A young man who wanted yeah. to be a pilot. You yeah. know, he didn't actually want to be the world's most famous man. And I'm sure at the time they sent him up, nobody realised that's what was going to happen. But in, in, you couldn't have picked a better personality to be, you know, the Soviet ambassador going around the world because he yeah. just was such a, a likable presence. Well, and you saw the guy. That, that was Koryov's pick. Yes. Interestingly enough. Yeah. Yeah, he, he saw all the, the uh, candidates. And I think the story goes that he came to show them uh, the Vostok spacecraft for the first time. He said, anyone want to get in? And everyone said, yeah, me, you know, of the six first cosmonauts. And Gagarin immediately removed his shoes. Yes. And he was the only one to do so. And he said, why are you taking your shoes off? He says, well, I don't want to trash it's up your it's nice, it's clean it's spacecraft. It's yeah. Yeah. And then all the other cosmonauts start taking off. <laughs> <laughs> so, true story, apparently. Oh, that's good um, to know. We well, put it in the place. So we're at half time. <laughs> Does anyone like to, uh, to ask some questions? Uh, make some comments. Or comments, you know, or heckling. Yeah. Sir. Yeah, um, I'm the generation who remembers the, the space shuttle. And one of the criticisms, uh, I admit, yeah. <laughs> uh, the Apollo missions were one of the greatest things mankind has ever done. 
considering how long we've been on this planet as a species. Um, but I've heard that it actually scuppered the progression of space exploration because before the Apollo missions, there was the thing called the hyperspace uh, missions, and apparently, if that had continued, then there would have been colonization of planets within the 80s. Do you f uh, do you feel that that's true, or because at the end of the day, it, it served its purpose, but it never really advanced science, and it only re and the, with the space shuttle, it only sort of rebooted science that we know today. That's definitely a question for John. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you for that, Piers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I don't remember doing hyperspace in my physics uh, undergraduate right. lectures, so I'm 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 not really sure what you're 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 referring to there. Um, you know, I'm afraid that the laws of physics are are pretty demanding and and mean that um, getting anywhere by the technology that we know about at right. present is a, a slow, painful business that requires a lot of energy. Gravity is, is a tough master to overcome. So, you know, I, and, and the shuttle was, though it might seem outdated and, well, it is, you know, it's old and, technology, yeah, isn't it? But, yeah. yeah, but it was... It was great for its time, wasn't it? It's, and we'll look yeah. back, I'm sure, in the future and see it as part of, of a yeah. progression. Right. You know, the, the, the history of the space program since Apollo has been, you know, there was a nosedive immediately after the end of the Apollo program and the shuttle came out of the ashes. And it was meant to be just a stepping stone towards stations and then interplanetary vehicles that would be built in low Earth orbit and go off and do things. And the, the money didn't come about. We built a space station... We built some terrific telescopes, Hubble and Chandra. So a lot got done, and there's plenty ahead, I think. But I think the shuttle, shuttle really uh, showed us how to do a lot of things and uh, served us well. And now that's the end of that particular era. And um, well, just to emphasise, if I, if I may, that you know, a lot has been going on. It might not always be as high profile because it's, you know, we're talking about unmanned uh, robotic probes here but you know so much has happened in space science we visited pretty much every planet you know, we've been to comets asteroids we've landed on all sorts of places um you know with remarkably sophisticated vehicles and our knowledge and understanding of our solar system has has you know just gone through the roof um, and neighbouring stars and, too. And, and neighbouring stars, and of course with the telescopes that, that you mentioned, Hubble and Chandra, just getting your telescopes above the Earth's atmosphere allows you to do so much. I mean, I'm sure people know that the, the atmosphere, though it allows light and radio and some infrared through, is really a very dirty window mm -hmm. for, for uh, an astronomer anyway. So just the simple act of putting your telescope just mm -hmm. above the atmosphere, which is essentially what you do with Hubble. Mm -hmm. it, it makes dramatic differences. And also, going above the atmosphere opens up that uh, so much of the electromagnetic spectrum that is uh, blocked off to us on the Earth. I mean, it's lucky for us, because we wouldn't be here, you know, if all that nasty X-ray, gamma ray, UV, and so on came through. Mm -hmm. But for an astronomer, it's a bit of a nuisance, so... <laughs> <laughs> Has, uh, anyone got a question for Rona? Sir? Uh, Microphone. Thank you. Uh, if ever there was something that was fact-based, it is science and space exploration. But does drama enable one to uh, explore deeper truths about what happened? Hmm. Um, I don't think it's for me to say, actually. I think that would be for an audience to say. Um... I think in terms, I, I, it's certainly true that in terms of writing a history play, you, usually you're dealing with history that's a lot longer ago and probably a lot less familiar to people. So you have so much more licence. So I was very much aware that you had, I had to get the facts right. But then there comes a point where you go, well, what is the purpose of this? And I think, 
you have to do several things for an audience. You have to entertain them, number one, because they've paid and they deserve a decent night out in the theatre. And then you, I think you have to tell a story that is in some sense universal, so it's not particular just to one man at one moment in time or, or one human act, if you like. It's something you can say, this is a story, I, I would say in the case of Little Eagles, about a, a huge dream and the mm -hmm. consequences of that for the world and for the individual who first dreamt it. So in that sense, I think you, you use the facts to tell that story. And uh, Whether that story is worth telling or whether you tell it effectively, I think that's for an audience to decide. Hi, we, we talk about the space race as though it's, it's over, um, but the Chinese are certainly starting to stretch their legs. Um, and uh, I was wondering if you think they are going through an era of inspiration um, with, uh, within their population and for what purpose, and whether you think this will kick off another race between either themselves and the US or themselves and India, um, and what the next era of space exploration will be? <laughs> well, it was interesting. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was at an um, international astronautics convention, and there was a dinner one night, and all the heads of the space agencies were there. It was a very small dinner, so the heads of international space agencies that have manned flight were there, and a couple of other people, uh, also important, and me. And uh, so it was fun to be the fly on the wall and, and listen to conversation. And at the time, the, Ch the two Chinese delegates leant across the table and said, we want to go to the International Space Station, which was all the other people around the table, all the other space partners. So their position uh, a couple of years ago was they, wa they wanted in. They wanted into the club, and uh, they were looking at collaboration. You can take it at face value. Um, I think, however... There is always rivalry between uh, countries in technology and prestige to some extent, less so than it was. And it's interesting to see that India is making you know, great efforts to, to be a presence in space too. So I'm hoping to see friendly competition and also friendly collaboration, I think, in the future. What do you think? Well, I have to make an admission here, yes, as I, I think I was... That out. Yeah. yeah. Three weeks ago, I signed up to a part-time position in Beijing. <laughs> so, does, uh, I guess that must mean something, or at least wh wh where I think the opportunities lie. I mean, frankly, you know, I've got probably 10 years left of a productive career, I hope, and I don't want to spend that time laying people off and closing labs, which, you know, might be the reality. Well, perhaps is the reality. Um, and there is absolutely no doubt, I've been visiting China probably for about five years now, There's, through US, uh, UK-China um, collaboration that was signed by um, the two ministers of science about uh, six or seven years ago. And uh, it, I, I've been, as most people are, so impressed by the facilities, by the people. I have to say by the openness, though, you know, I, I appreciate that what I do is space science and, and everything is published in the open literature and so on. So I see great opportunities there. I, I mean, I have to say that much of their program is driven by issues of, of national prestige. They've, had, they've got their second lunar orbiter orbiting at the moment. They've had the, the Taikonauts, the, the, the Chinese astronauts in space. And I think science has been an add-on. But, well, if that's the way it is, let's, let's be a part of that science. And I can see real opportunities for British and European scientists to get involved. So I'm giving it a go. All right. You heard it from John. OK, I think we'll uh, hold on the questions for a minute because we've got 20 minutes left, and I would really like to talk a little bit about the future. So, down the past. So, the next 50 years uh, in space, what's ahead? 
Well, I must say, as some, the, the, the European Space Programme is wonderful. And, and I have to say, I am a fan of ESA, the European Space Agency. But the programme does seem, you know, we plan so far ahead now that you can almost it see the programme. It takes a <laughs> long time, yeah. So, um, the you boss, know, the, the next... The boss was complaining that he had time to get one project done within his working career, and then he dies. <laughs> And uh, Jean-Jacques Dordain, and uh, that he would like to see three or four, the next guys, the kids, as he called them, see three or four things happen within their careers. Yeah. The trouble is, I mean, if you're talking about the outer solar system, which is one of the areas that interests me, it does actually take you quite a few years even to get there. Right. Uh, and I've, I've no doubt in the next, certainly in the next 50 years, we shall go to Europa, we shall go to Ganymede. Uh, probes or... First of all, first of all, orbiters. Then we'll, you know, right. either put penetrators down or, or we'll land gently on the surface. I think we'll put a a, a boat down on the surface in, in one of Titan's methane seas. Mm. Um, no smoking. Probably a balloon, yeah. an aeroplane in in the Martian atmosphere. Yeah. Um, you know, fun stuff like that. I, I mean, one thing about the solar system is that the more we study it, the more interesting environments we, fa- That's we true. find. You know, places like Enceladus, this boring yeah. lump of ice a couple of hundred kilometres across orbiting Saturn. Right. Who, who'd have thought that it's spewing out water, organic molecules, goodness knows what's going underneath the surface to, to power that. And Actually, we, all the moons turned out to be a lot more interesting than, some of the than we gave them credit for. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the ocean on Europa. Yeah. So... Uh, so you know, th- that's an area where scientifically we're going to make real progress in the next 50 years. Okay. So, Rona, what would you like to see? What do you think would be inspiring that you prepare to pay your taxes and, uh, <laughs> and watch and enjoy over the next 50 years? Well, again, I, like, like you, I'm biased, scale. so I'd certainly up my contribution to a fiver a year if I'm only having to pay three pounds at the moment. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I'll go as high as a tenner, you know. It's, right. <laughs> I'm sure Give most people here would. Um, I think it, it's interesting, isn't it? Because, I, I mean, I'm, I'm always... Because I know so little about the subject, obviously, but having to do publicity about it at the moment, I'm constantly asked the question of why is it we can't do it anymore? And in a, you know, it, or rather, given that people got all the way to the moon with, if, correct me if I'm wrong, a computer that had less calculating power than a modern mobile phone... Mm-hmm. Why can't we do it now? Is it because we don't want to? Is it because it's too expensive? And I suppose coming back to that thing, what is the purpose of a dream like that? Where, where should we be going? Um, I would like to see us going everywhere. And I would like to see you know, my son's generation and the generation behind him inspired as we were. I think by that sense, even though we've kind of pointed out that it was a bit of an illusion, that sense of common humanity. Um, and it sounds from what you're saying that it's more possible now than it was then, that it's something that mm. maybe finally we will be doing it in peace for all mankind, which would be rather nice. Yeah. I, I'm looking forward um, to it a lot. I just wish they'd get on with it quicker, sort of. Or I have to do more clean living to enjoy it uh, <laughs> out to the full. Um, you know, for... Uh, astronauts and quite a lot of planetary scientists, Mars is the Holy Grail. Yeah. Uh, it really is. You know, it had an ocean two billion years ago in a nice thick atmosphere. It was warm. So um, I'm pretty sure there's nobody at home now. It's almost a hard vacuum. But there might have been something there. below the surface? Don't you think there could be bugs crawling around? I think they could have a whole underground system there. Uh, no, I don't, I don't think so. I, I'll bet you not. I think it's been too cold and too hard a vacuum for too long, uh, sadly. Um, but before, maybe there was time for something to evolve in you know, a warm little salty Martian ocean. I don't know. Let, let me go, ask you go and if, have I, a look. if I go may, and have a look. Yeah. as an astronaut, I mean, going to Mars mm-hmm. is relatively easy. But it's, it's surely bringing people back. Oh, I think it's a big challenge. Well, discuss. It's the 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 showstopper. uh, Well, there's two showstoppers. One is, um, uh, you know, radiation, the exposure, the dose you'll pick up on the way there and on the way back using current technology. Two hundred days out, five hundred days on the surface, two hundred days back, which looks like a sort of mission profile that we could do with 
sort of extendable technology from where we are now, that would clobber you pretty badly. That would, that would leave you not very well. So we haven't solved that problem. We really haven't solved that problem. Then there's uh, a lot of really, you know, they sound like little nits, but they're really s significant uh, technological challenges. A life support system that won't break down, you know? We don't have it on ISS. Uh, we're getting there, but uh, we don't have it yet. That's, some, that's the next generation of technology. So the spacecraft that takes people to Mars, uh, I think is a little way off, but I could see it happening within my lifetime, I think, I hope. Is it true, uh, that, or is that an apocryphal story, that they're actually looking for volunteers that would be prepared to just go there and stay? No, I think there was, uh, there was people who volunteered themselves. That was <laughs> I, I, got this, I got this really nice glossy pamphlet from a guy who sent it in to me, and I saw reading at my desk in the astronaut office, and it said, Lone Eagle, and the motto was, One Man, One Way. <laughs> so I, hope, so I, hope, I hope he wasn't looking at me. But... Um, <laughs> But no, I think the idea is to, to get them there and back. Right. And uh, hopefully, you know, have enough time and resources with robots as well to poke around and thoroughly explore the place and answer some of the questions. You can almost imagine that in the old sort of Soviet system that you described in, in oh, your play, that that would have been acceptable perhaps. Yes. But yeah. not anymore, I suspect. Not unless you use grad students, I think. <laughs> that was a bitter laugh from the back there. Yeah. <laughs> um, They're cheap and expendable. There you go. There's a lot of them. But um, that's, that's something we're seeing. Co the complete expiration of the solar system, I think, we can look forward to within the next 50 years. And now the crunch question, which we talked about earlier, because nobody likes to answer this because it requires a feat of imagination and a little nod to the people who write science fiction. But what about starships in the far future. Some people say it's just flat out impossible. You could never make a ship and give it enough energy to go anywhere except the solar system. What do you think? <laughs> it's a tough one. It is a tough one. It is a tough one. Um, yeah, surely it's doable. Surely it's doable. I mean, when you set off, you don't have to have cracked all of the problems, do you? I mean, you, you're talking about m many generations. That's one way to do it, yeah? that's for sure. You know, and yeah. you, you kind of fix the problems along the way. Yeah. And after a while, I guess you'd forget where you came from. You know? <laughs> right. And People so would stop you'd calling. lose the desire yeah. to go back yeah, so, home yeah. because... Yeah, the taxes, oh. yeah, or something, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, I, I, I don't... I don't think the issues are technological. It's 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 more emotional and and you know the the, the knowledge of leaving planet Earth forever yeah. and 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 never never returning. That's that's. Well, it would that's certainly it. take technology so we can't even imagine, but that's okay because they're they're out there. You know, people 400 years ago couldn't really understand or imagine the technologies that we deal with. So why shouldn't you know 300 years from now there be something really impressive that gets you around? But, you know, you wouldn't have to go very fast, would you? You know, if you've got lots of generations. Well, you know, there's things to do, people to meet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Books to write. That's and, right. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, it would have to be probably, like you say, a 200-year voyage or something, first off. See, okay. that's very interesting, sitting here as a consumer of science fiction, especially the television mm -hmm. variety, um, as opposed to a scientist. So I'm, 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 my heart's sinking. You're basically saying there will never be any such thing as a warp drive. Uh, <laughs> don't know. I, you know, the current understanding of the laws of physics says uh, not, but, you know, uh, maybe if you can't... Uh, so as Arthur Clarke said, if you can't uh, beat Einstein, maybe you can avoid him. So, uh, who, who knows? Um, yeah, I mean, you, you, you can travel faster than the speed of light, surely, but only if you've always been travelling faster than the speed of light. Right. Isn't that right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah, this so, is the barrier itself. Yeah. Right. Interesting. All right. Questions? Sir? Um, <clears throat> Piers, I think you've answered uh, David Bowie's question, is there life on Mars? Um, is there likely, do you out. think, <laughs> is there likely to be, uh, do you think, intelligent life in our solar system 
or in indeed the universe, what do you think the probability of such a thing is? Do you think it's fanciful stuff that's just put in newspapers to uh, whip up a bit of a frenzy, or do you think there is a distinct possibility that there are other intelligent life forms out there and we just haven't come across them yet? Well, that, that's a great question, and it's the sort of thing that we sit around at night and, and talk about uh, incoherently sometimes. Uh, <laughs> In the solar system, I think I'm pretty, you know, I'd be delighted if we found a, uh, a little microbe creeping around somewhere in the solar system. It, it, it wouldn't relate to anything that uh, our biochemistry quite probably, but maybe there's something creeping around in Europa. I doubt very much it's intelligent. I doubt there's any intelligent life in, in this solar system. Is there intelligent <laughs> besides us? John accepted. John accepted. And Rona, too. But, um... But, but elsewhere, you know, uh, Johnny von Neumann, years ago, this mathematician who was involved in the, in the bomb project, he said um, he thought that if people, if there was intelligent life out there, there was technological and starfaring, they would have gone all over the galaxy and they'd have basically bought up all the property everywhere within a few millions of years. So his question was, where are they? Because if they were there, they should be everywhere. And uh, it, it's a tough one to answer because we don't see any signs, uh, no transmissions, no beer cans on other planets, you know, nothing, nothing left. So right now the answer is uh, it's quite possible that we're alone, which is not uh, the most gratifying thought, but it's quite possible that we're alone. What do you think? Before I answer that, just um, you alluded to David Bowie, didn't you? Or, yeah. or, or the questioner did. I, I, in the context of Mars, I always like Elton John's description of Mars, which was, Mars ain't the kind of place to raise your kids. In fact, it's cold as hell. Yeah. I always like that sort of yeah. s slightly sure. unscientific, right, yeah. but uh, factually correct description. Right. <laughs> um, what was the question? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Life elsewhere, life in the universe. Well, you should have been in this very room on the 25th and 26th of January last year. There was a wonderful two-day meeting on the very subject. In fact, it was very broad. If I remember correctly, it was... Uh, I can't remember the exact title, but the second part of it was the scientific and societal implications of the discovery of life. And it was an absolutely wonderful meeting because we had not only you know, the, the usual crowd of, of scientists, astronomers, space scientists, and so on, but we had um, social scientists, theologians, um, anthropologists, and so on, all considering the topic. And it was, yeah, I'm not sure that we came to a conclusion. If you buy the wonderful um, <laughs> Phil Trans Roy Sock, the proceedings of that meeting, you can, you can read all about it, but it was, it was a wonderful meeting. Um, it, it is a, it's an absolutely uplifting subject. I mean, yeah, I, I it's, have it's to say that those two days that I spent here, even though I was a co-organiser, worrying about whether the whole thing would work... Well, what was, was the bottom line, like David Bowie, though? So what did they, what did they it, come up with? Well, you know, there's the Drake equation, yeah, you know, okay. which yeah. I'm sure you know, several people know yeah. about the Drake equation. N equals, and then a whole bunch of factors yeah. which you multiply together to give N the number of intelligent, communicable in, um, intelligences in, in, in our Milky Way. And the answer you can get is, is still, even with the, the fact that we're tying down one or two of those factors a little bit, you can get anything from one, which is us, to billions, or right. at least millions. Right. The jury's still out. It is. Do you want to find them? Ooh. It's, it, it's an interesting one, isn't it? Yeah. I th I, again, I think, because you, you think of it in terms of imagination, the fact that it's become a real possibility has had an extraordinary effect on how we consider ourselves and the kind of stories we tell each other. Um, yes, if they're friendly. I think we'd all say that, <laughs> wouldn't we? <laughs> well, it, it's interesting the question has moved from one of science fiction to science, scientific discussion. And uh, with, with more facts to go on, we know a lot more about alien environments now from just poking around our own solar system. And by also grubbing around at home on Earth, we found out that life survives in some pretty unlikely places, Absolutely. which came as a bit of a shocker you know, to, the, to biologists that there were 
there were things living around volcanic vents at the bottom of the ocean, mm. breathing not, not the stuff. Not just living, but seeming to be quite Th- happy. Thriving, yeah, thriving, thriving, talking to each other. You know, yeah, it's they're, 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 that's right. Yeah. So that's right. The, the word extremophile is, is used to describe them. It's yes. I love that word. Yeah, it's yeah. good. Extremophile sounds politically radical, doesn't it? Yes. Um, this question is for all three of you. I was wondering who you think is more um, more of an important character or more memorable, Yuri or, or Armstrong, considering one left the confines of his planet and first, and the, <laughs> the other set foot on another celestial body first. Which one do you think is more memorable or an important character? Was that for me? Was it, um, Sorry. Um, <laughs> I, I wouldn't want to pick between them, actually. I'm um, sorry, that sounds like I'm sitting on the fence. In different ways. Uh, um, I think the, the difference being, I suppose, that Gagarin was so much less clued up about what he was letting himself in for. And there's a kind of... that's a cert- to, to me, and I'll be frank, they're both heroes. You know, they, they are both heroes and they're both an inspiration, and I am wildly biased about it, but... Um, I think they're different types of heroes. So Gagarin is that guy that really doesn't know what he's letting himself in for, but is just basically up for it. And Armstrong, the more I read about him, I think, what an amazing man. And I don't know, have you met him? Quite a few times, yeah. Right. Um, I, I always have the impression, and it could be completely wrong, that he was smart enough to see what being the first man to walk on the moon would mean and decided he wanted nothing to do with it. He wanted to be Neil Armstrong. Mm -hmm. And that's why he is so publicity shy. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that the intelligence of that and and is... is, But the other thing... Yeah, the insight is is remarkable. But the other thing, and again, I don't know if this is true or not, but is it, it that I read that when they were doing that final descent into the moon... And what they're basically having is a continual computer crash, which they didn't even know that's what was happening. And someone had to keep running into the back room and ask the computer guys what error 101... Was it error 101? 1202. 1202. Steve Steve Bales was a 26-year-old who said, keep going. Keep going, it's fine. It'll reboot in a second. And he wasn't sure. And basically, am I right, Armstrong is landing on manual because they're not where they should be and the computer hasn't... You know, it's all going wrong. So he's... And he's got to the point where the fuel, they're past the point of no return. So in other yeah. words, if it goes wrong, they are stuck there. Right. And what I read was Buzz Aldrin's heart rate was like right up there and, and um, Armstrong's went up a bit. Yeah. And, <laughs> and that just, yeah, the guys... Yeah, took over and parked it. Yeah. Six, 16 yeah. seconds of fuel left, yeah. So, yeah, my, my vote, um, you know... You have to salute the achievement of, of Korolev first and then Gagarin, I think, for the first person in space. I mean, that, that's, that's massive. But as an as a icon and as a, a, a personal sort of um, enshrined figure for most people in the business, Neil Armstrong's very tough to beat. This, this man has, has done everything. He flew the X-15, which is basically a you know, piloted missile, barely piloted missile, and survived that. Killed a lot of people, the, well, a couple of other people, the same aircraft. And, uh, you know, Gemini 8, uh, that mission went pear-shaped, and he pulled it out of the bag. And then, of course, the lunar landing. So this man is so technically competent, so intelligent, and so modest. When you talk to him, um, his humility, is, it's real. And he talks to you. He's not aware of, or he doesn't seem to be overly aware of his importance. Or anything like that. He just talks like a regular person. He's very interested in science too, in the history of science. He um, gave a talk about James Watt possibly meeting, I can't remember the other great scientist of the day. And uh, so the, the man, the man, he's, he's something of a Renaissance man. Very interesting guy. Oh, that's good to know. John. Yeah? Yes, I'm just reminded. I, I met him once briefly last year in in London, and I must say I was a little bit prepared not to be impressed. But I was madly impressed. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I have to say, he, he was as you described. He yeah. just seemed, you know, and, and he must have been doing this for years yeah. on, on the road and, right. and so on. Still gracious. He, he was very gracious indeed. And I was just reminded of, of what you said there. He, 
we just just chatting briefly, and I don't know how it came up, but I think I mentioned something about the National Maritime Museum at Greenwich, yeah. and he said that whenever he has a chance, that when he's in London, he goes off there on his own mm-hmm. to look at the Harrison clocks, the chronometers. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he just loves them, and he just goes there unannounced and, and takes a look. Well, our meter is running out, so I think we've got time for just closing comments from each of us. So I'll start with you. Oh, gosh. Um, you didn't warn us of that. I didn't. No. I thought I'd just spring out. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, to what, to sum up our whole impression? The whole thing. Any something you'd like to say sum on the whole business of space? Inspiration, the future, the past? Well, I think what we've uncovered is that space certainly has been inspiration for all of us in different ways. Um, and in the fact that so many of you have come here to listen to us, it clearly is an inspiration for a lot of other people as well. Um, I, I, and we're talking about heroes. I mean, here we are, we've just come to the end and we're talking about heroes. And, and now, of course, there are heroines up there as well. I think there's something about um, that, that act of moving outside the Earth's atmosphere, which is, is, is just by definition inspiring and... That is, yeah, that's, that's it. That's what I want to say. <laughs> well, I'd just like to say how much I've enjoyed reading a version of, of your play. Um, and for, for those of us who have been involved in space research, at least in the West, e- even now, so much of what happened in, in the Soviet Union is still a mystery. I mean, I guess a lot of it has, has come out. So to me, the, the, that is something which is, you know, the, the play, the, the research you've done, and, and I guess using the records that are available, you, you, can, you can now do this. And it's, it's kind of redressing the balance because we had on one side this very savvy PR machine on, on, on the uh, US side and this very, very different machine on, on the other side. And, and it is wonderful to see the human stories that, that you know, you, you are bringing to light through the play, which people must go and see. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for saying that. That's right. Uh, okay, when it, it's the Hampstead Theatre. The Hampstead Theatre starts 16th of April. Excellent. That's right. Be there or be square. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, my, my thought really is uh, uh, take, trying to take the long view, as I get older, um, that for... The last thousand years, it was uh, people trying to explore the oceans and ships, and it was a difficult, dangerous business, uh, but still, you know, there was no shortage of people who wanted to give it a try. And the result of all of that effort was that uh, the old world discovered the new world and all the riches that came out of that. So I think the next thousand years, it's space, and um, it's the next great adventure. I'm sure there'll be upsets and, you know, retrenchments and all the rest of it, but um, there's something about, you know, that appeals to humanity to pack up and go out and have a look. So, something to look forward to. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you for your attention. Ladies and gentlemen, what a journey we have been on this evening. We have been to Siberia, we've been to the moon, we've been to America, we've been to Beijing, we've been to Titan and Ganymede and Mars and a host of other comets and asteroids and planets throughout our solar system. And we've also been to Highgate Cemetery and Barnsley Astronomical Society. And what a pleasure it's been to spend an hour getting away from the rather mundane and parochial concerns of our own everyday lives to see the things that John and Piers and Rona have painted on the twin canvases of the firmament of space and the human imagination. Please join with me in thanking them all in the traditional way.